associated with uh, various uh, natural embeddings, sigma i, uh, uh, you know, prime s of f into Rn. And uh, so we can embed uh, GL to f into this J equals to one to n GL to R. That's a natural one. So whenever if gamma is uh, Aij is in GL to f, so gamma, sigma one, sigma two, these are the embeddings. So it will be denote, uh, so this will denote the matrix Aij one, Aij two, et cetera. So this is in the product now. So each is coming from one of these GL to R. So that will be the uh, conception where your Aij n is simply sigma m Aij. This M will be the Mth embedding that will be indicated. So we take gamma in GL to F and K is K1, K2, Kn. I'm not taking equal any K in, uh, you know, this positive integers. And so this will be uh, the weight of the form that I'm going to define. Uh, and Z is uh, tuple, like in Cn, Z1, Z2, Zn. And for a scalar, so we denote uh, this determinant of gamma before I go to the definition of uh, Hilbert modular form, I'm just defining the notations. So determinant gamma as we expect, it will be determinant gamma, sigma one, sigma two up to sigma n. And Cz, this is the script Z that is written, will be C1, Z1 plus D1 up to Cn, Zn plus Dn. Where your CI is at sigma IC and DI is at sigma ID, the i uh, one, and for CD in the PDF. And uh, Z to the power K, K remember it's K1, K2, Kn, so it is Z, uh, ZI to the power KJ, J equals to 1 to N. And gamma K will be uh, take all this gamma KJ and take the product. So I'll be denoting K naught by the max of this uh, positive integers K1, K2, Kn. So you have to remember this K naught. And AK is simply A to the power, you take this uh, sum here, uh, Kj, J equals to one to N. Okay, so this is the notations that I uh, need uh, while going ahead, uh, defining uh, what is an Hilbert modular form. So we start with H, the point theory upper half plane, and we consider the n copies of uh, H. And uh, there's an action of GL2 plus Rn via component wise, and each component it is the Mobius transformation that we know. So this will be my action for uh, on Hn, GL2 plus Rn. And the classical modular form, this is the definition that uh, classical modular form of weight K on gamma I n, this is a holomorphic function from Hn to C. And uh, such that I know it, uh, when you apply this gamma on Z, it uh, transforms like that. The symmetries are like that. This is determinant gamma to the power minus K over two, Cz plus D to the power K F of Z for all gamma and gamma. So again, space of such forms of weight K and level N, N is this ideal, remember, or gothic N, whatever you call it, is denoted by MK gamma I N, standard notation. And actually, if you are uh, not taking Q, F is uh, uh, not equal to Q, then the usual requirement of holomorphicity at the cusps is not needed for Hilbert modular form. So there's something called Kesher principle, which assures that it always has that. So this is a classical modular form definition. And uh, such a function f has a Fourier expansion of this form. Uh, so uh, c of psi, x trace of psi z, so I'll just define. Here x is the standard notation, e 2 pi i x. And trace is simply you take the sum of all these embeddings, sigma j, theta, z j, psi z z. And, uh, so the summation runs over zero also, and the totally pos positive elements of this. So totally positive means, as I told you, that uh, uh, the signs are totally positive, that when you go to apply this uh, embedding, it goes to R and should be positive. Okay, and in the Fourier expansion, if uh, the, the, the constant term is zero, not there, then it, it is called a cusp form. 
So now you, you remember the H is the uh, narrow class uh, uh, number that we had. So if I have I between one to H and for each of them, I can define a classical Hilbert modular form of a fixed weight K for the congruent subgroup. And then uh, there is a notion of uh, Simura, which uh, associates this H tuple F1, F2, FH, the classical one, weight K uh, on this gamma I, uh, N an adelic Hilbert modular form F. And this uh, adelic form, so each this tuple H will be associated to one of these adelic uh, Hilbert modular form. And it is well known that this is an automorphic form on GL to AF, uh, where your AF is the Adel ring of F. Adel ring in people who are, uh, you know, and students. It's just the, uh, you know, the restricted product of uh, the field with uh, take it completion, uh, with respect to all the valuations, some restrictions. So this is the language which helps you, uh, you know, uh, uh, associating with it a lot of other uh, arithmetic and uh, can help you to prove many results, which otherwise might be difficult to do it for individual classical forms. So this will be my notation for the space of idyllic Hilbert cusp forms of weight K and level N, they will be denoted by SK, uh, this N, similar notation. Now there is a one uh, natural question will be there, what is the relation? So a CMF will be the Fourier coefficients of this idyllic uh, cusp form that Hilbert cusp form that I'll be uh, using for F. And you remember that AI psi will be the, was the uh, Fourier coefficients of the classical forms for each I. So they need to have a relationship between the CMF and this uh, individual Fourier coefficients of the classical form. And this is the relationship. Sometimes I'll be writing CFM. So just sometimes it is like this. So this is AI psi, psi to the power minus uh, uh, K naught by two. Remember K naught is the max of K1, K to KN. Uh, a norm, the usual norm of this in, uh, integral ideal M over K naught by two. So that's the relationship. And uh, uh, so for, for each integral ideal M, that's what it holds, where M has some forms, psi, TI inverse, you remember, TI is one of the representatives of those H uh, classes that we had for the narrow class group uh, for uh, unique I and for some totally positive element shy of F. So that's what M, should will turn out. So this is the relationship between uh, this uh, Fourier coefficients of the Delic Hilbert form, uh, modular form, and uh, for the classical ones. So that will be utilized. Okay, so this is the setup that uh, that uh, uh, I wanted to put in front of you, and I'll be working in, in this setup. And uh, the fundamental result that was in the uh, in the introduction I was talking about is this fundamental result. And I'll be, the main part of the talk is an application, two applications in fact, of this particular result. And so this is a this is the first work that I was talking about uh, with Risha Vagniyotri and this has appeared in uh, Ramanujan journal. So this is the result and uh, I'll not be going into any kind of, uh, you know, just I'll be using this result to show in front of you two applications of this result. So F and G are two adelic uh, Hilbert primitive cusp forms. So they are Heke eigenforms, normalized Heke eigenforms. So suppose F is a positive smooth, so what is called the uh, uh, cutoff function, as a nice function, which has, which has support on half one, this closed interval. So F is, will be always this, uh, this F will be always for be this uh, smooth positive cutoff functions that will be used. And X is totally positive. This is the notation for totally positive. So F and G are two Adelic cusp forms, silver cusp forms. This is a smooth, uh, positive smooth cutoff function. And this X is totally positive. Then for any C, if you take it from half and one, and for every epsilon uh, uh, positive, so there are possibilities that you have F is equal to G and F is not equal to G. So when if f is g equal to g, so then always there exists a, a constant a f this is the form that we are talking f is equal to g now, and this is the cutoff function that we mentioned bigger than zero such that 
I'll come this. This is uh, just to tell you that, you know, we are uh, looking to the square free uh, integral ideals. So these are square free integral ideals. Square free means, you know, uh, you have this integral ideal, then you have this unique uh, expansion, unique fact uh, factorization in terms of prime ideals. So no prime, uh, I mean, the exponents are all one. So that's what square free, the usual generalization of square free uh, integer. Uh, so this, this uh, hash uh, indicates that these are square free and this simply means that it is generated by LMM. So uh, the absolute value of CFM square, and this is the cutoff function. So I have this constant times X, and this is a uh, uh, big O of, uh, so we have to, this uh, norm of this N, the level comes up here. This K naught is the maximal, maximum K1, K2, Kn, and uh, N is that uh, degree of the extension that we had. So this is, this is the result for uh, when F is equal to G, and when F is not equal to G, then, uh, uh, you know, CFM, CGM, again, this F of norm of N by X is um, this, there is no constant term here. Uh, the AFF doesn't happen, so it's big O of this. So X to the power C, I just want you to look at these exponents a bit because this will be, the, uh, will be used in the later part. And here the implied constant uh, depends only on epsilon and the field that we are working in. And uh, also one can show that this uh, AFF is uh, uh, bigger than uh, K naught N, this norm of this N to the power minus epsilon. Again, here the constant would be depending on this field and the epsilon. Okay, so this is the fundamental result that uh, we'll be using to get uh, some uh, interesting information on the Fourier coefficients of this uh, uh, adelic uh, Hilbert forms. As I was telling that the hash, uh, this uh, indicates that the sum is over square free integral ideals, and this will be denoted by, to show that that's generated by M and N. Because the first, I go into the first application. So as I was telling you, one of the classical problem is to determine a modular form by a subset of all the Fourier coefficients. So that's like a stern kind of uh, bound. So the most talked about result in this case is, as I was telling you, the stern's bound, which states you, which states that that uh, there exists a positive constant, positive constant lambda, such that if a a f n is zero, n up, you know, all up to lambda, and k is the weight, and then the function, uh, then the form is zero in fact. So you have to check on, check only this many Fourier coefficient, coefficients to conclude whether the form is identically equal to zero. The same thing can be uh, transformed into two, you know, uh, different, uh, in the same question that it, it, it take two different forms and you want to check that when they are equal. So uh, if AFN and equal to AGN up to that, then you are sure that these two forms are identical. So this is a very useful criteria to have. And uh, a similar question would be uh, that, uh, you know, uh, as we are talking about a subset of all the Fourier coefficients, so square-free Fourier coefficients. Now, how many square-free Fourier coefficients are required uh, to determine a modular form? You, know, you can guess that we are going with the fundamental result to remember the sum was over uh, the square-free uh, integral ideals. And uh, so in this direction for classical modular form, this answer was given by uh, uh, Anambi and uh, Shomodas. And uh, uh, I'll come to that result. So it was, the, so the question is about the, how many square free Fourier coefficients you need to conclude about the uh, strong kind of result for uh, classical form. So that was answered by Anambi and um, Shomodas. And they use prime number theorem for L function associated to uh, this uh, primitive cusp forms and obtained an upper bound, which was uh, exponential in fact in nature. But then later they improved uh, the previous paper, uh, the upper bound, and they used rankin selberg L function for primitive cusp forms. This is that we also will be using for primitive cusp forms. And uh, uh, they proved 
So this is by Das and Anambi. So n is a positive integer and chi a uh, Dirichlet character modulo this n with uh, conductor um, m chi such that n over m chi is square free. So that's the setup. n over m chi is square free and take any form in s k n chi. Uh, uh, it is non-zero and fix an epsilon bigger than zero. Then there exists a square free integer n. So this is the bound. K to the power k is the weight three plus epsilon. N is that uh, you know conductor seven over two plus epsilon, seven by two plus epsilon. So you have to check up to that such that AFN is non-zero. Where the implied constant depends only on epsilon because it's a classical form. So, so that's how, I mean, uh, uh, AFN is zero to check that whether the form is uh, not zero, you have to go up to this. And if, you know, uh, uh, if it's non-zero, then you will find a uh, Fourier coefficient AFN for this N, which is non-zero. Because this, this, uh, this was the classical uh, result, which is uh, not uh, too long ago. And it was by Das and Anandi. And uh, so we, we considered the same problem for Hilbert modular forms, for those, uh, you know, those idyllic uh, Hilbert modular forms. Okay, so the setup has to be uh, uh, a little bit, let's remember that uh, this is a non-zero, uh, non-zero, uh, this uh, idyllic Hilbert cusp form. Uh, this is my, our weight, square free level. Now I have square free level, I just explained that the, in the unifactorization, no exponents are all one for the prime ideals that you have. And uh, this is an integral ideal. And uh, so this is the norm of this uh, integral ideal that we're talking. And uh, uh, at K naught, as we have decided that uh, it's the maximal um, uh, and the maximum of this K1, K2, Kn. So this is the result that we take uh, Adelic uh, Hilbert cusp form non zero with this Fourier coefficients CFM. Then there exists a square free integral ideal M with uh, the norm is bounded by this K naught. K naught is the maximum, now maximum, maximal of these things. 3n plus epsilon. Norm of this integral ideal 6n square plus 1 over two plus epsilon. Remember that was seven over two for them. Such that CFM is non-zero. And here the implied constant uh, depends on epsilon certainly and also on the field F that over that, uh, over which this is a totally real field of degree N of uh, 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 extension degree N and over which we are considering this uh, Adelie Kilbert as form. So this is a generalization. Uh, is a generalization of uh, the, the result of uh, Das and Anambi for Hilbert modular forms. Okay, so I just give a brief uh, idea how the, it's a brief, the main, uh, in, the, in, the, in the paper, the main part, main work was there to really prove that fundamental result. And uh, this part is uh, uh, not so technical, so I thought of giving a little bit of clear. So this is uh, the ranking Selberg L function, F potential G. So F and G are two primitive cusp forms in SKN. And we consider this uh, Dirichlet series. That's so I'll define what is zeta Fn to S, a CFM, CJN by, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have taken two primitive cusp forms and we are considering the separate norm of M to the power S. And uh, so this part I'll just define in the next year too. Uh, and this is this part I'm calling Rs F tensor G. This is an L function that I'll be considering. And another one is Ln. This is the level that we are talking about, S F tensor G. So this is for P dividing this particular uh, ideal, one minus NP one factor, another factor is alpha I P beta J. So this alpha, uh, alpha I's and beta J's are the roots of the quadratic polynomial a standard one, which is like x square minus this pf Fourier coefficient count plus psi p comes there, psi p is zero or one. These are the roots. So there are two of them, f and g, so alpha one and beta one, alpha two and beta two. So this is my ln and uh, lb. Uh, so these are few, uh, I'll give, you, uh, give the relationship between them. This is a bit of work that I 
gone to in the paper. So LBSF tensor G is uh, one plus CPF, CGF, and norm P to the power minus S. This is same as, uh, again, the ashes for that particular uh, notation that I defined CFM, CGM by M, M to the power S. So these are the three uh, L functions. Where you know, zeta Fn is simply the dedicated zeta function, the field that we have, zeta F2S, and take all the uh, 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 ideals that divide uh, N, so one minus N a, a norm of that ideal to the power minus two S. So this is zeta F N for me, and R S F cross F tensor G is the rest of the, that L function, the, 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 the next term is there. Okay, so this is my zeta F N. And uh, this, is a, this is the following relationship between the above, uh, this Dirichlet uh, series that we have defined. So L N S F cross G, some work is there. So it is L S F cross G, F tensor G times some uh, nice, uh, nice Dirichlet series, which is absolutely convergent for real S bigger than half. So this L L N L N S F tensor G is same as L S F tensor G times a nice Dirichlet series and L to the, the B S F tensor G is simply L N and L N already I know. So again, I will have this uh, HS there. And uh, so FS and HS are Dirichlet series which are absolutely convergent for this uh, plane. So that can be shown. So let us define this L infinity, another one. I'm coming to this uh, uh, result of Shimura. So L infinity S F tensor G is uh, this gamma uh, product of the gamma factors with this power of uh, this pi comes there. And then let us denote by uh, la, uh, delta uh, lambda S F tensor G is this. So I have this uh, norm of this different times that integral to the power S, this L infinity is there. And then I'll, I have this L S F tensor G, the main, uh, uh, the ranking cell work thing that I had uh, mentioned in the first. Then this, so if we consider this lambda S F tensor G, this particular uh, series, then we have this result of Shimura which states that this admits this lambda S F tensor G admits an analytic continuation to C. It's an entire function if F is not equal to G. And if F is equal to G, it has a meromorphic continuation to the whole plane with possible simple poles at S equals to one and S equals to zero. Okay, and the, at, 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 at S equal to one, uh, I mean, Shimura gives the residue of uh, this uh, particular uh, L, uh, L function. So this is a group of units, OF star. So this is the result that one will be using. This, uh, this, uh, this uh, residue also one will be using at S equals to one. So this function is nice and uh, it has either it's an entire function or uh, it has a meromorphic continuation except uh, these tools maybe. And uh, at S equal to one also he gives the residue. So this is uh, Shimura's result. Okay, so this is the background that is required to prove that uh, particularly, I think, uh, 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 you know, square, how many square free integral ideals determine a form. Uh, the similar question that Das and Anambi had answered for uh, classical forms. So we need, so there is a, a similar new form a theory for Hilbert modular forms that will be appealing here. So uh, this, so this F1, F2, Fm. So this is the basis for the space of new forms. Let with k and level dividing uh, eta for S K N for S K N. Then if I take a uh, F, which is non-zero in S K N, then this new form theory tells me that F is actually, you can get it through these FIs by the slash operators. So I equals to one to M, this is this for each of them. A I Q, I come to this F I stroke B Q. I'll just define what is F I stroke B Q. And these AI Qs are zero, zero if FI is not a new form of level N by Q, Q dividing N, so N over Q. And the stroke operator, that uh, shift operator that is called F stroke uh, BQ is simply N of Q to the power minus K naught by two and F you apply this one zero zero Q inverse. 
So in fact, it maps SKN to SKNQ. So MQ inverse, S, uh, CFM becomes MQ inverse, in fact. So, uh, so here, this is Adele getting the Q such that Q infinity is one and Q of Q times OF is in fact this, uh, this ideal Q that you get back. This is a, a well-known uh, received operator. So you start with any form, uh, Hilbert, uh, Adele Hilbert modular form, Hilbert Gus form. Then through this basis, you can uh, write this F in terms of this uh, particular basis. So let us take a, uh, an ideal Q naught, which divides N, the ideal that uh, in the level that we have started with, with the property that uh, norm of this Q naught is less than or equal to norm Q prime for any ideal Q prime, which is not Q naught, dividing the level. And this AI Q naught is not equal to zero, minimal in some sense. For some i, so this is this is uh, uh, this is the Q naught that our one will be working. So remember, this is an ideal with the property that norm of this will be always less than or equal to norm of Q prime for any other uh, ideal dividing that uh, level, and correspondingly, a i Q naught is not zero for some i. This is it's minimal in this sense, Q naught. Okay, so this is four. So let me uh, go to 44. Four is that a new form theory. So I'll be comparing the coefficients here. So comparing the Fourier coefficients indexed now Q naught M. Q naught, remember, this is Q naught that we are talking about. Uh, square free ideal co prime to the level N. So what we get is CF of Q naught M. So I'll be interested into this particular Q naught times M is simply AIQ CFI, FI is each of those uh, basis elements, Q naught M by Q. I equals to one to M, this is that basis. And look at all the uh, uh, Qs that divide N. And then I will have CF, that Q naught M level is AIQ C of FI Q naught M by Q. So this is just by comparing uh, the coefficients. So we need this. So here you note that in the norm of Q uh, is less than norm of Q naught. If suppose this happens, that uh, you get a Q which is less than that Q naught, then this is zero. That's what the definition was there. And also if Q naught equal to Q naught, then this is zero, okay? So, so for some M, so out of this, we'll get some R number of them. Not all of them will survive. This will in fact become I equals to one to R A I Q naught C F I M. Okay, that's by this little argument we can uh, uh, get from here this year thing that you know what are the coefficients that will be surviving, looking into that fact. So this is the thing that uh, will be required for us. That C F Q naught M Q naught with that particular property is A I Q naught C F I M. Some for some R up to M less than or equal to M. So now let, 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 let us define this object S, which is, remember we had the fundamental result talks about some bound of this. So we, we define S is CF is Q naught M uh, the square, and then the cutoff function NM by X, F NM by X. Let's define by S this one. So now just go ahead and just, uh, separate it out. So it's AI Q naught CF and take the bar of that one do a little bit of this calculations and then you can separate it out uh, with uh, I equals to one to R, the square CFM, CFIM square F, and then the bars will come here. So this can be written as this plus this, just separating it out. And now we use the fundamental theorem because that theorem gives us uh, the, the bound for this CFIM M square, this part. So we use that one. And this AFIF comes up here because here uh, we have uh, uh, separated it out in that fashion. And remember, this is the, uh, the, the, the exponents of uh, K naught is the maximal uh, element in K1, K2, K, and it comes out there. Okay. Now, here you want us to just apply uh, now Cauchy Schwartz inequality. And uh, the bound on R, R is that, you know, this dimension of the space. 
uh, SK N by Q naught. We just put it here and we can get uh, from this inequality, this S is bigger than bigger than uh, this AIQ Q naught square times this part. So just I have to use the Cauchy Schwarz uh, here and use the estimation for the bound here for the uh, N by Q naught level. Now, since uh, here, this is independent uh, of the choice of, uh, you see here, choice of that particular uh, cutoff function F. So we can choose as uh, whatever is convenient for us. We choose in such a way so that F is between zero and one. And uh, this CF Q naught M absolute value square norm of X between X by two and X is bigger than equal to this particular term. Now we are, I have to just choose uh, I, I have to choose my X and uh, the C properly so that the right hand side becomes positive and I have the result. Right? Because it is CF Q not M absolute value square is what I get, this part is positive. So, that, uh, so that's how it has been, uh, it's, it's been proven using this ranking server and using uh, this fundamental result that I had quoted uh, in the beginning. Uh, to get, uh, you know, how many Fourier coefficients getting some bound on the, some form of a number on the number, uh, you know, in terms of the norms that you have to check so that to check the form is non-zero. So this is the first application uh, that I wanted to show you. And the second application is about the changes of sign, sign changes of the Fourier coefficients that I was telling you. So this, in this, this work contains, this is a part of that one and also in some form of arithmetic progression because you remember we are talking about the, uh, the, the narrow class group. So we have defined the, uh, uh, the arithmetic progression by taking it each core set of this. Uh, it's just some somewhat generalization of what we have arithmetic progression in terms when we have integers similar to that. So this is one result and the other result I'm not coming. So that is an arithmetic progression. So this is about, uh, so uh, this is a joint work with uh, Krishnarjuna and Agniyotri. This is in communication. Uh, so again, F is a, a primitive Adelie Hilbert cusp form as we have defined with this weight and level is an integral ideal N. Then this sequence, these are the Fourier coefficients you remember, CMF has infinitely many sign changes where M runs through the square free integral ideals of F. So, to, uh, and, uh, uh, so whenever you say infinitely many, so can you get some kind of a quantitative uh, result? So the number of sign changes in CMF with, if you take, if you, uh, you know, this is the natural bound that you will put, it at, it's at least X to the power half for large uh, n of x. So this is a result which I will again want to give a little uh, flavor of that before I end. Okay, so infinitely many sign changes and at least that many sign changes will be there uh, if you uh, uh, bound your ideals that over which is varying up to x. What is the strategy? Strategy is uh, compare the growth of these two sums. So this already, as I told you, this is the fundamental uh, result that the square of the Fourier coefficients norm up to X. And again, this hash will indicate that part that over square free uh, integral ideals, this sum is varying. And for CMF, so this was already known by the fundamental result. So this is what is unknown. So this paper contains uh, an estimation for this. So to, to get an estimation of CMF, we define what is S, we call it SQS, uh, CMF by norm M to the power S. Again, uh, M is running over the square free things. And we have this product over prime ideals now, one plus C PVF by NP to the power S. It's a nice function. Now, if we apply Ramanujan bound here, which is a known result here, that uh, CMF is norm M to the power epsilon for depending on epsilon, then we can uh, show that this is absolutely convergent for real S bigger than one. So by using Ramanujan bound just here, one can with little bit of work, very little work, one can show that this SQS is absolutely convergent for real S bigger than one. But we want 
little more. So in order to proceed further, we want uh, we show that in fact this can be analytically continued to the region real s bigger than half. So that's the next target. Okay. So with, with this in mind, to this end, we uh, let us define this uh, dr. You know this goth r s again. Some ideal will be there. So take all the CMF by n m to the power s and take all the divisors uh, of this uh, ideal divisors of this m and then. This is same as uh, you know uh, the C R M F by N R M to the power S. So this is my D R S. And then a little bit of work, uh, you can uh, one can easily show that S Q S is in fact S Q S. Remember, this is the thing that uh, we want to. So S Q S uh, is uh, for me this C M F by N M to the power S is the product. So this mu function is the same way you can define as you have for a mu for the integers. So again, you look at the uh, look at all the uh, uh, prime divisors of this one, and uh, if all of them exponents are one, then minus one to the power uh, the number of those ideals and zero otherwise. So from here, one can show that using this that SQS the term that uh, we want to show that it is uh, analytically continued uh, from this half ELS bigger than half onwards. So SQS can be written like this. And suppose if we define our SPS, this P is uh, the CPF squared by NP to the power 2S and the here psi star is simply uh, the idyllic version of what is called the idyllic, uh, idyllic AK character. So not going into that one, norm P to the power minus 2S and CPF by N uh, P to the power S plus one. Suppose I define SPS by this. Then this is some work to show that SQS, in fact, LSF times, uh, you know, product over all primes, one plus SPS. So this is this is the benefit of that one. And here on the right hand side, the product is uh, the product on the right hand side is absolutely convergent for real s bigger than half. Okay, so that's the upshot from here is that SQS has an analytic continuation to the plane real s bigger than half. Okay. So we are able to show that one that it is absolutely convergent. Uh, I mean, it's analytically you can analytically continue it to the plane from uh, real s bigger than half onwards. So how does that help? That helps us uh, using you know again not going into the details by uh, some slight variation of Perron's formula, we can estimate this sum, which was our target to get an estimate for CMF, where uh, by the partial sum that n norm up to x. And with uh, square free ideals. So we can show that it is big O of x to the power half plus epsilon. That was the target. Similar to that, what we have. And already we had from the uh, fundamental result, we know that c square mf is afx plus again x to the power half plus epsilon. So these two are there for us. How does this to help us to get uh, the sign changes? So there is a result of uh, interesting result of Meher and uh, Javan Meher and uh, Ram Murthy, which states that uh, it's for any sequence of real numbers, uh, satisfying that an is big of n to the power alpha, such that your an is past n up to x is x to the power beta and n square is cx times o x to the power gamma. This is similar to what we have here for CMF and c square mf. Where alpha, beta, gamma, and C are non-negative constants, and if alpha plus beta is less than one, then for any R satisfying in between this max of alpha plus beta gamma is the max enough in one, the sequence has at least one sign change for n in, in this interval. At least one. An in particular sequence has infinitely many sign changes, and the number of sign changes for n, give the bound is also given x to the power one minus r for sufficiently large x. Now you can see that we'll be applying this one. We have all this data with us to get uh, the result. So we can take alpha equals to epsilon, beta gamma equal to half plus epsilon that we have there. So it will become uh, one minus half and x to the power half, it comes at least so many. But how does the proof goes? A brief before I conclude. Suppose on the contrary, suppose we have only finitely many negative uh, negatives. So without loss of generality, we can assume that there are only finitely many negative terms, CMF are there. 
So therefore, if you go to a large uh, X, you will have all positive things there. When your NM is, uh, let's say this interval, X, X to the power R, where R is, uh, you know, uh, less than, uh, is, is maybe other way between one and a half. So we have this result already uh, from our uh, uh, previous discussions and the fundamental result tells you the other way around that X, uh, R is bigger than half, we have X to the power R is less, less C square MF. That gives us the contradiction that uh, this thing that we have started with, that uh, the, 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 there are only finite dimension. Okay, so this way, and uh, so using this uh, multi meher uh, also one can conclude that there are infinite too many side chains. So that is what uh, is there for me today to speak to you. And uh, this is this references that I was talking about. This is Das and Anambi, and this is uh, some long back I did with Yanis uh, Petridis. So this is the call Swiss uh, uh, Ramurti and uh, Ramurtis, and uh, then we have this. So these are a few things that are being used in this particular talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And um, are there uh, any questions? There were many questions and comments uh, during uh, the talk. Well, I did not want to interrupt the speaker. Yeah, yeah, let me see if I can. Yeah. Uh, now maybe some people, uh, if, uh, well, it seems that uh, they've uh, successfully answered uh, more or less all the issues already in the comments, maybe. Maybe there are still some more questions. Maybe Zay, if you, you have a question. Bill is in the there. mail. Bill is in the mail. That's <laughs> in the mail. Aziz Bill. is there. Some, some questions from Aziz. That would be interesting. Uh, so you have sent me some mail, Aziz, or? Uh... <laughs> uh, one, one question is, uh, for the number of sign changes, what, this is just a lower bound. What do you think is the truth? Yeah, that is a good question, but I don't know. This is uh, just uh, the bound that we get from there, but uh, the truth, I mean, the, uh, can one improve that one or sharp or not? So that part is not known to me. Maybe you know, so you, you have some ideas. Known over the rationals for classical modular forms? I thought there was some sharper results available there. Yeah, uh, sharper know. than uh, sharper than Stamps one. Yeah, are there any any is there anything sharper? I thought sound had done something. I, I just don't remember. Sound maybe maybe yes. Yeah, I, I remember seeing something that's improving that uh, particular bound. Yeah, so that's a good good query. So maybe one would try to see what, if one can improve that. Yeah. No, uh, I just doesn't come to my mind right now. If in the audience, someone can answer. Okay, uh, there is Akash Simka Roy who wants to ask a question. Please, sure. uh, please unmute go ahead. yourself. Yeah, you can unmute yourself, Akash. Unmute yourself, please. He's muted. Oh, sir, thank you for the beautiful uh, oh. Sir, so I had just, uh, I just had a small question about theorem three. Uh, theorem three was talking about your, that uh, sign change, uh, huh? Okay, so let me uh, go into theorem three. Yes, sir. I think so. Yeah. No, that part was... non-zero, like C or M. Ah, okay. So it's just. This is theorem three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, so, uh, just wondering. Your voice is uh, trembling. Breaking. Breaking. Yes. No, can't, can't, can't Make understand. The phone around. The idea on depends on F and epsilon. So, do we know how, what the. Sir, can you hear me now? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's go ahead. Try. Yes. Uh, no. Sir, so I was just wondering, is it possible to make explicit the dependence on F and epsilon? In the yeah. bound. 
Yeah, so our method uh, really doesn't give that one. So to make it explicit, maybe you have to really go back with all the estimation that we are using, should be possible to do it. Okay. But I don't know, did, did this work that we have done it, there's, we, we haven't tried to really make it explicit. So and I, I'm, uh, should be possible if you go back the estimation that we are using for other uh, Dirichlet series and other things. So it may not be that easy though. All right. Okay. But so yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, that's uh, uh, that's another work that one has to do really. I see. I Make see. it explicit. Okay. okay, sir. Thank you. Thanks again for the beautiful yeah, yeah. talk. Yeah, sure. Thanks. And well, any more questions? Okay. Then uh, let us speak. Uh, thank the speaker again. And yeah. we restart in uh, three, yeah. four minutes. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank wow. you. Yeah, I'll be there. Michelle, are you here? Yes, I am here. You are here. Let us try uh, how it works. Yeah, okay. So do you like me to share my screen? Yeah, well, uh, it depends. Well, how are, other, um, are you going to give your talk? Uh, well, you will have yes, to. I... Yeah, you can share your screen. Uh, yeah, okay, very well. You see the, the screen, okay. Yes, good. you see the screen, yes. Okay, good. Uh, hello, Michelle. By the way, Yuri, uh, yes. I, I am supposed to speak uh, how long? I think it's 50 minutes. 50, okay. Yes. 50 minutes. Uh, I prepared too many slides, so at the end, I will just uh, skip. Okay, you'll just cut off. Uh, well, I think uh, you certainly don't have time for 100 something slides, yes. Yes, 104, yes, <laughs> which is too much, but uh, I, I, I think my, the file is on my website, so people who are interested to get uh, more information can just uh, download the, the file. Okay, so at some moment you will have just to wrap up uh, and... Uh, yes, exactly, at, at the end, I, I will see it, it's easier for me to to have more slides. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for the nice video. Excuse me, Banu. Thanks for the nice video on the. Yes. yes. I, I was sure, sorry. I could not attend it, but yes. uh, after that, I received the, the record and I looked at uh, part of it and I saw that uh, my video was, was there. So I was glad that I could uh, participate. Yeah. It, it was a short uh, speech I gave, but uh, we have so many uh, memories together and so many experience. And uh, yes. I, I am very glad that I have the opportunity to, to participate to, to this conference now. Yeah, that is true, but uh, it is not really a, something like an offline conference where we can spend some time together. Right? Well, hopefully in five years, it will be okay. Thanks. For your 75th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So let us continue. Well, our next speaker is Michel Waldschmidt from uh, University Paris 6. Uh, oh, I don't know how it is called now, but for, for me it is still. Fact, <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Sorbonne University now. Sorbonne but, uh, University or whatever, yeah. Uh, yeah, is uh, he will speak on Schoenow's conjecture, the well, algebraic independence of transcendental numbers. Okay, please go ahead, Michel. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, for the introduction. And uh, I will give a survey on some uh, very well known result, which is a uh, uh, statement, which is Schoenow's conjecture. And so I will uh, not be exhaustive, I will not. 
uh, comprehensive on, on this topic because when I prepared this talk, I found that uh, there were a lot of uh, variation on, on this topic and uh, I will just uh, cover some, some of, of it. So, Chanuel's conjecture is the following statement. If you take complex numbers x1, xn, which are linearly independent of a q, and if you consider the two n numbers x1, xn, exponential x1, and exponential xn, among these two n numbers, at least n are algebraically independent. What is remarkable is that uh, this statement takes uh, just uh, four lines uh, here, and uh, the consequences are really remarkable. So I will try to present the state of the art on this topic. When I write x, x I mean exponential z, so e power z. So in this statement, uh, we speak of linear independence of a q. This is uh, in the hypothesis. So this is just, we look at the q vector space, and this is the classical uh, definition of uh, linear independence. And for example, the linear independence of one and x means that uh, x is irrational, it, if it is the linear independence of a q. And the basic example is the logarithm of the prime numbers. They are linear independent of a q, and this is just the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. If p1, b1, pn, bn equal one with the bi which are in z, then the bi are all zero. Uh, we will speak also of linear independence over the field of algebraic numbers. So uh, what, what I denote by q bar is the algebraic closure, closure of q into c. So this is the field of algebraic numbers. <coughs> Now the linear independence of one and x of a q bar is just to say that x is a transcendental number. And if you come back to the previous example with one log two log three log five and log p, the fact that they are linearly independent of a q bar is far from being easy. And it is a special case of a theorem of Baker in 1968. So logarithm of prime numbers are linearly independent over the field of algebraic numbers. And then in the statement, we speak of uh, algebraic independence. So when we have complex numbers, we ask whether they are algebraically independent of a Q, which means that uh, there is non-zero non no non-zero polynomial uh, with rational coefficients uh, so that the polynomial vanishes at x1, xn. It is a, a fundamental fact which we prove using uh, uh, algebra that uh, to say that uh, numbers are algebraically independent of a Q is the same as to say that they are algebraically independent of a Q bar. This means that if you have a non-zero polynomial which vanishes uh, at x1, xn with algebraic coefficients, then there is a non-zero polynomial with rational coefficients which vanishes there. And we take for P the product of the conjugates of Q. We take the different embeddings of uh, the field of coefficients into C. So for n equal one to say that x1 is algebraically independent means that x1 is transcendental. And of course, if uh, x1, xn are algebraically independent, each xi is transcendental. Uh, it's convenient to speak of the transcendence degree of uh, an extension. When we have a field extension, we look at the maximal number of the big field, which are algebraically independent of the small field. And this maximal number is the transcendence degree and in the case of uh, zero characteristic, uh, the small field will be, by definition, by uh, convention, Q. So we will speak only of the transcendence degree of a Q, but it is the same as the transcendence degree of the field of algebraic numbers. So uh, the transcendence degree of Q of T1, Tm is M if and only if T1, Tm are algebraically independent, which means that uh, we have M elements uh, T1, Tm, which are algebraically independent. And for m equal one, when we have just uh, one element uh, T or X, the transcendence degree is zero if and only if the element is algebraic, and it is one if the element is transcendental. And so the fact that uh, the transcendence degree of uh, the uh, Q is the same as over the field of algebraic numbers comes from the additivity of the transcendence degree. If we have k1 contains in k2, k contains in k3, then the large, uh, the, the degree of the large extension is the sum of the two uh, other degrees. And an algebraic extension is an extension of transcendence degree zero. Okay, so these were the definitions 
uh, we have uh, one early example of algebraically independent numbers, which is given by the lindemann weierstrass theorem in 1885. If we have algebraic numbers which are linearly independent, beta 1, beta n, then the exponential of beta 1 and exponential of beta n are algebraically independent. As I said before, they are algebraically independent over Q, which is the same as over Q bar. So this uh, statement is one of the very few statements of uh, algebraic independence, but the fact that it was possible to prove that is due to the fact that the uh, algebraic independence of exponential is the same as linear independent of the exponential, because when you take monomials, you get another exponential. And so there are some equivalent form of the lindemann weierstrass theorem. The one which I stated before is when you take beta 1, beta n, which are linearly independent of a Q, the exponential are algebraically independent of a Q or of a Q bar, and the converse is true. But this statement is equivalent to linear independence. You take algebraic numbers and gamma 1, gamma n, the exponential are linearly independent if and only if the gamma are distinct. And what is interesting is that uh, you see here that uh, in this statement to say over Q or over Q bar for algebraic independence is the same, but to say linear independence over Q or over Q bar is not at all the same. But it turns out that it is equivalent because of the equivalence between the two statements. Uh, if you have the uh, linear independence of a Q, then you deduce the algebraic independence statement here of a Q, and therefore of a Q bar, and then you come back and you have linear independence of a Q bar. Okay, so uh, I would like to explain the history of uh, Schanuel's conjecture going back to a paper by Gelfond in the Compte Rendu de l'Académie des Sciences de Paris in 1934. It is just a one page paper, which is really remarkable. You see, this is just uh, the statement which I will explain. And uh, I suppose that uh, even with the screen, it's not easy for you to, to read it. And especially it is in French. So I translated it for you and I enlarged it. And uh, so the next slides are just to, to repeat what was in this one page paper of Gelfond. So the... Uh, the note in the compte rendu of Gelfond is the following. Let P be a polynomial in uh, n plus m variables with rational integer coefficients. You take algebraic numbers alpha and beta, the beta are different from 0 and 1, and you look at the polynomial at the point exponential of alpha 1, exponential of alpha n, this is for the x, and log beta 1, log beta m, this is for the y. Assume that, uh, well, the, the, this uh, equality equals zero is impossible. If you assume that the numbers alpha one, alpha n are linearly independent over the field of uh, rational numbers and the numbers log beta one, log beta m also. So this is the first statement. And uh, Gelfond comments, this theorem includes a special cases, the theorem of Hermit and Lindemann, the complete solution of Hilbert's problem this was the transcendence of uh, alpha to the beta, or the, the fact that uh, log alpha one over log alpha two is, is uh, transcendental if uh, it is irrational. The transcendence of the numbers exponential omega one, exponential omega two, where omega one, omega two are algebraic numbers, and the theorem on the re relative transcendence of the number e and pi. We say now the algebraic independence of e and pi. So this is a claim by Gelfond. But there is a second claim which is that uh, if you take the iterative exponential where the omega are algebraic numbers, and you take the alphas like this, here it was with E, the basis of exponential, but here it is with algebraic numbers, with this condition on the alpha, then these numbers are transcendental, and they are algebraically independent. Among numbers of this form, there is no non-trivial algebraic relation with rational integer coefficients. Well, at that time, there was a competition between uh, Gelfond and Schneider because they solved uh, at the same time and uh, more or less independently Hilbert Seven's problem. So Gelfond wanted to say that uh, he's uh, ahead on, on this topic. But uh, when he said that the proof of this result and few other results 
on transcendental numbers, we will be given in another journal. Uh, we, we are still waiting for the proofs of, uh, of this result. But uh, it, it shows that uh, Gelfon did not know a statement as simple as uh, uh, Chanuel's conjecture, because all this, these statements are consequences of Chanuel's conjecture, but they do not imply Chanuel's conjecture. Uh, also, Martin Eblo pointed out to me that the condition on alpha two, alpha two different from zero and one in this statement here is not the right one. It should be that alpha two is an irrational number, algebraic irrational. So uh, the statement of Chanuel, uh, the conjecture, is that if x1, xn are culinarily independent complex numbers, the transcendence degree of this field is at least n. So this is the, the statement of the conjecture which uh, I want to discuss today. This conjecture came from a course given by Serge Lang at Columbia in the 60s. And uh, well, many mathematicians attended this course. Uh, for example, Nagata attended this course and uh, uh, made, made some conjecture at, at this time, which was solved by Bombieri. And so uh, this conjecture was not uh, published by Chanuel himself, but it was published in the Book of Lang, Introduction to Transcendental Numbers. There are some formal analogs of uh, Chanuel conjecture. And the first one was a theorem due to Axe, which is a version of Chanuel's conjecture for power series over C. And Coleman uh, 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 gave a, a proof for power series over Cuba. I mentioned some work by Brunawell and Kubota on the elliptic analog of Axe theorem. Uh, Brunawell was a student of Chanuel. So th there would be a lot of uh, things. A, a full lecture could be devoted to Axe theorem and variant. So this is a picture of Brunawell and uh, Chanuel. Uh, especially methods from logic has been developed by uh, Ruchowski, Zilber, Kirby, and uh, many others. Ruchowski introduced the predimension function and Zilbert the pseudo exponentiation. And uh, I just uh, give some reference here to papers by Kirby and Zilbert and then and Zilbert and then uh, Wilkie. By the way, I do not expect that you are able to write down the references which I give so fast, but uh, my, my file, the, the file of uh, this uh, lecture is on my website. So if you want to, to uh, look at it uh, at a more leisure pace, uh, you can just uh, download it. I mentioned also some uh, paper by Daniel Bertrand on Chanvel's conjecture for non isot constant ellipticers of uh, function fields. And in fact, if uh, you look at the recent literature, uh, if you look at the name Axe Chanuel, you will see a lot of papers devoted to Axe Chanuel for Shimura varieties, for variation of Hodge structure, for uh, the modular invariant, linear differential equation. And uh, many of these papers are related with O minimality. So th there is a, a, a wide topic which I will not discuss. I come back to the lindemann weierstrass theorem, which I mentioned earlier, because it is one of the very few cases where we are able to say that Chanuel's conjecture is true. It is the case where you assume that the numbers x1, xn are algebraic. In this case, only n numbers are there, exponential x1, exponential xn, and the lindemann weierstrass theorem tells you that uh, these n numbers are algebraically independent. So this is really one of the very few cases where we know the result. The fact that uh, the claim, the, the con consequence is that the transcendent degree is at least n is uh, quite uh, clear. We cannot uh, ask uh, more. So we have examples where the transcendent degree is not more than n. We see it, for example, with the uh, lindemann weierstrass theorem. But uh, if you select uh, the exponential of x1, exponential of xs to be algebraic, and xs plus 1, xn to be algebraic, then you, when you look at this field, the transcendence degree is the same as the field which is here, and you have only n numbers. And so the conjecture in this case is that the transcendence degree is n, and this is one of the claims of uh, Gelfond. But this, this is not uh, known at all. So uh, n is uh, optimal, 
for some examples. But uh, if you look at uh, almost all numbers, then the transcendence degree is better. It is 2n. The set of n tuples such, such that the 2n numbers are algebraically independent is a generic set for dynamical systems, which means that it, it is a countable intersection of dense open sets in Berg classification. And also, it has full Lebesgue measure. So this looks uh, nice, but uh, the exponential function has nothing to, to do with that. We can replace the exponential function by any transcendental function. So I mentioned Baer. Uh, Baer is one of my ancestors in my mathematical genealogy. I, I wrote to the mathematical genealogy uh, to complete the, uh, the genealogy of Baer because uh, uh, I had some information about that. So they put it on the on the website, but then they withdraw it. So, so far, uh, Baer has uh, no ancestors on this genealogy. I would like to mention some joint work which I made with uh, uh, Santil Kumar and Sangadurai, where we uh, ask that the x, x1, xn, and the exponential are Liouville numbers. And we can ask, in this case, what is the transcendence degree of this field? And we can show that uh, if you choose m between 1 and n, there exist uncountably many tuples such that the x and the exponential are Liouville numbers, and the transcendence degree is just n plus m. So this uh, shows uh, this is a, a nice result, but uh, it's not, uh, th th there is one uh, gap, which is that uh, here we ask m greater than or equal to 1. And so we would like to know whether. It, it works for m equals zero. And uh, uh, even the, the simple problem to prove that there are Liouville numbers x such that exponential of x and x are Liouville numbers and the two numbers are algebraically dependent, we, we were not able to, to solve this problem. So this will be my first uh, open problem. Well, not really the first, because the very first one is Chanuel's conjecture, of course. But this is uh, one challenge to, to, to decide whether there are new numbers uh, x and exponential of x, which are algebraically dependent. Let us look at uh, some special cases of uh, Chanuel's conjecture. The, the first uh, natural case to look at is n equal one, and n equal one is, is solved. It means that uh, if you have a non zero complex number, then one at least of the two numbers x and exponential of x is transcendental. This is Hermit Lindemann theorem. So uh, the consequence, consequences of uh, Hermit Lindemann theorem are the transcendence of uh, e pi log 2 exponential of square root of 2. So this is a, a, a nice situation, but as soon as n is at least 2, uh, Chanuel's conjecture is open. So let us look at the case n equal to you have two numbers x1, x2, which are linearly independent, and you have four numbers x1, x2, exponential x1, exponential x2. And the conjecture is that at least two are algebraically independent. Of course, we know that one at least is uh, transcendental, and even uh, two of them between x1, exponential x1, and x2, exponential x2. But to prove that they are algebraically independent, uh, it's open. And such a statement would have a lot of uh, consequences, wh which are still uh, open. The algebraic independence of E and pi, the algebraic independence of E and exponential of E. We do not know whether the exponential of E is transcendental. The algebraic independence of log 2 and 2 power log 2. We do not know whether this number is transcendental or even irrational. And the algebraic independence of two logarithms of algebraic numbers, wh which is one very important open problem, which I will discuss later. Uh, it's easy to deduce many consequences of Chanuel's conjecture. You write some numbers using the numbers e, pi, the logarithm, and the exponential. And uh, so I just uh, put uh, randomly some numbers like this. And then it's a nice uh, exercise to prove that uh, all these numbers are algebraically independent. Uh, so you see, you, you can build a lot of uh, examples like this, but what is remarkable is that Chanuel's conjecture implies anything like this. 
there is a, an example, an exercise in the Lang's book, uh, which, which is a bit puzzling, which is the following. You start with the rational number field and you add to E0, which is Q, you add all the values of the exponential function at the algebraic point. You have a new field, which is E1, and then you add to the algebraic closure of E1 all the exponential of numbers belonging to E1. And you continue like this. And you take for E the union of all the EN. And Lang suggest, uh, uh, Serge Lang uh, suggested that uh, the conjecture of Chanuel implies that the number pi does not belong to E. And this is not such an easy exercise. And to solve this exercise, it's easier to prove something stronger, which is that using Chanuel's conjecture, the numbers pi, log pi, log log pi, and so on are algebraically independent of E. And uh, it turns out that uh, by induction, it's easier to, to prove this uh, stronger version. And in fact, uh, this uh, exercise was solved in a nice way. Uh, I will explain uh, how it was done, but uh, the idea was to introduce another field. Instead of using the exponential function, you take the logarithm. There are several values of the logarithm of a non-zero complex number, but you take all these values. And so the variant of Lang's exercise is the following. You start with L0, which is Q. You add to Q all the logarithm of algebraic numbers, each uh, non-zero algebraic number. Each non-zero algebraic number has several logarithms. You take all of them, which means that you take a 2i pi in the, your field. And then you have a new field. You take the algebraic closure and you continue. So the, the y which I write here are the logarithm of algebraic numbers, the logarithm of the element of ln minus 1. You take the union. And the analog of uh, Lang's exercise is to say that uh, if you assume Chanuel's conjecture, the number E does not belong to L, to this big field, the L-like logarithm. And more precisely, that uh, the numbers E, exponential of E, exponential of exponential of E, and so on, are algebraically independent of L. Uh, so a, a solution of uh, both exercises was obtained in uh, 2009 by a group of students who attended the Arizona Winter School in 2008. And the, the, the solution that they give is to prove that, uh, uh, assuming Chanuel's conjecture, the two fields E and L that I introduced are linearly disjoint of a Q bar. And uh, for solving this uh, problem, uh, they uh, got the help of uh, Georges Racinet. So there would be a lot of things to say on, on this contribution, but uh, I just uh, mentioned that uh, recently there was an Abelian analog of Chanuel's conjecture, uh, which was discussed by Philippon Saha and Saha, and uh, they solved the analog of the problem which I mentioned with uh, E and L, but uh, it was in, in the Abelian case, in the case of Abelian uh, varieties. And the generalization of this was done with the help of uh, Christiana Bertolin. And this was published uh, very recently uh, on the semi-Abelian semi analog of Chanuel conjecture and application. So instead of Abelian varieties, we take uh, uh, semi-Abelian varieties. Now, uh, to prove uh, Chanuel's conjecture, one needs to prove results of algebraic independence. The first result of algebraic independence was the lindemann weierstrass theorem. And then there were a lot of contributions by many mathematicians. And I will uh, start by explaining the contribution by Gelfond. There was some contribution by Siegel using E functions, which goes in a slightly different uh, direction. And I, I give you two references on the uh, algebraic independence. Uh, one, which is the uh, uh, encyclopedia by Feldman and Nesterienko edited by Parshin and Shafarevich, and the other is uh, Nesterengo and Philippon, a lecture notes in mathematics. So the very first important step uh, for algebraic independence was something which is called now small transcendence degree. It was done by Gelfond in 1948, and Gelfond uh, proved the algebraic independence of two numbers, 
which are some specific numbers, but this was the first step of uh, whole theory, which uh, is uh, very active nowadays. And these were the numbers two raised to the power cube root of two and two raised to the power cube root of four. And Gelfand proved that they are algebraically independent. And more precisely, if you take numbers of the form alpha power beta power i, where i is between one and d minus one, d is the degree of beta and d is at least three, among these uh, d minus one numbers, two at least are algebraically independent. The proof was uh, really amazing. It, it was extremely interesting. It in, intro, introduced a, a lot of uh, tools like uh, criterion for algebraic independence and uh, uh, also uh, zero estimate. And so the, the proof is uh, beautiful. And uh, the, the proof was developed uh, as I will uh, explain now. So when you look at the numbers which are here, it is natural to ask, what is the transcendence degree? How many of them are algebraically independent? And this is the so-called problem of Gelfand and Schneider, which was a, a problem uh, raised by both of them independently. Uh, it was raised by Gelfand in 1948 and by Schneider in 1952. And the conjecture is that these d minus one numbers are algebraically independent. And if you want to deduce that of Schneider's conjecture, it is a little bit easier to prove something a little bit stronger, which is that if you take log alpha and the alpha to the beta, uh, you have d numbers. Here you have d minus one, here you have d. These d numbers are algebraically independent. This is a conjecture. And what is the state of the art on this conjecture? Many people have uh, worked and made some progress after Gelfond. The most important progress was done by Shudnovsky. And then uh, it was blocked by Philippon, Nesterienko, and the last word uh, on this specific problem was uh, done by Guy Diaz, who proved that the transcendence degree is at least the integral part of d plus one over two. So if you take d equal three, uh, you have two. So two of the numbers are algebraically independent. So I give you three references. I already gave the reference of the Encyclopedia of Feldman and Nesterienko, the reference of the lecture notes of uh, Nesterienko and Philippon. But there is a third reference, which is uh, very interesting, which is a book by Nesterienko on algebraic independence, which is published by Narosa Publishing House. A few words about uh, other uh, situation where the similar problem arises. The first one is about periodic transcendental numbers. We can define the exponential function uh, for the periodic field. And uh, many results which are known for complex numbers are known for periodic numbers with essentially two exceptions. The first exception, which is quite an important one, is the periodic analog of the lindemann weierstrass theorem. And this is open in the case of periodic numbers. And this is due to the fact that the exponential function in the periodic case has a radius of convergence which is uh, finite, and uh, it's not an, an entire function. And so this is an important open problem. And the second one is the periodic analog of Gelfand theorem on the algebraic independence of alpha power beta and alpha power beta square when beta is a cubic irrational. In fact, the statement that they are algebraically independent uh, is in the thesis of Adams in 1966. He gives the proof when d is at least four that two of the numbers are algebraically independent. And he said the, the same proof works for d equal three. But this is not true. For d equal three, for the degree three, a cubic number, his proof can be adapted to prove the algebraic independence of two of the numbers log alpha, alpha beta, and alpha beta square. But this problem here, problem two, is, uh, is still open. It's a very interesting challenge. There is another domain where there is some transcendence, which is the transcendence in finite characteristic. And there is a variant of Chanuel's conjecture, which was introduced by Federico Pellarin for the Carlitz exponential in 2017. So the, one of the main tools in the Gelfond's approach 
which was developed by Brunawell, Philippon, Chunovsky, Nesterienko, Lorenboa, is a criterion for transcendence. I will not discuss it in general, but uh, this criterion was one of the main obstacles to go from small transcendence degree to large transcendence degree, and a very important step was done by Grigory Chunovsky. I'd like to mention one result which uh, was proved uh, independently by Brunawell and myself in 1972, uh, which is that uh, one at least of the two following statements is true. The first statement is that exponential of pi square is transcendental, and the second is that E and pi are algebraically independent. Of course, we expect both statements to be true, but uh, uh, quite often in this uh, domain, when we are not able to prove a result, we prove that uh, among several uh, numbers, uh, one of at least is uh, transcendental. So I mentioned the contribution of Shunovsky uh, in 1976, and uh, a little bit after, uh, Shunovsky proved a very amazing result, which is that the two numbers pi and gamma from one fourth are algebraically independent. So uh, this is not a consequence of Shanwell's conjecture because it involved the, the gamma function, but uh, this is a quite important step because we did not know the transcendence of uh, gamma of one fourth at that time. And the same is true for pi and gamma of one third. So this, was, uh, this result was in 1978. And uh, in 1996, uh, Nesterienko got a very large uh, generalization, which is the algebraic independence of gamma of one fourth pi and exponential of pi. And you see again, it is interesting because we, do not, we did not know before that, that pi and exponential of pi were algebraically independent. If you try to prove the algebraic independence of pi and exponential of pi using Gelfand's uh, method, uh, you will see that uh, it almost works. The, 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 the proof uh, just uh, fails at one point, but uh, you just uh, have to adjust some constant and. Uh, I have tried a number of times to, to prove the algebraic independence of pi and exponential of pi using Gelfand's approach. And uh, because of that, I expected that the algebraic independence of pi and exponential of pi would be proved at the same time as the fact that exponential of pi is not a Liouvin number. And uh, Nesterienko proved the algebraic independence of pi and exponential of pi but we still do not know how to prove that exponential of pi is not a Liouville number. So this is an open problem. So after the contribution of Shunovsky and Nesterienko, the next open problem is the algebraic independence of pi and E, and maybe this will come from a stronger result, like the algebraic independence of the three numbers, E, pi, and exponential of pi. So we do not know. OK, I will spend some time to discuss the most important special case of Chanuel's conjecture, which is the conjecture of algebraic independence of logarithm of algebraic numbers. Very often, you see this conjecture stated as Chanuel's conjecture, but it's only a special case. The conjecture of algebraic independence of logarithm does not contain the uh, conjecture of algebraic independence of E and pi, for example. It, it deals only with logarithm. So this conjecture is the following. You take logarithm of uh, algebraic numbers which are linearly independent. Because there are several choice for the logarithm, I prefer to say that you start with complex numbers, lambda one, lambda n, and the assumption is that the exponential are algebraic numbers. Like this, there is no ambiguity on the choice of the logarithm. And the conjecture is that the numbers lambda one, lambda n, are algebraically independent of a Q or of a Q bar, as you, as you wish. This is a very important uh, open problem. And if you state this conjecture in this way, you can say that nothing is known in the sense that uh, we do not know that the transcendence degree is at least two. We do not know that uh, there exist two algebraically independent logarithms of algebraic numbers. And I want to explain that uh, when you have a problem on which you know nothing, uh, you can change a little bit the way to state the problem in an equivalent way, and then say, oh, we, we can see something. 
even not in this form, but in, in another form. The result of the fundamental result of Baker on linear independence of logarithm of algebraic numbers is that if logarithm of algebraic numbers are Q linearly independent, then they are Q bar linearly independent, even with one. So the conjecture of Chanuel is on algebraic independence. The theorem of Baker is with linear independence. And of course, it's a special case of Chanuel's conjecture. I like uh, to quote uh, the definition of Baker theorem. I will use the notation L later. L is a set of complex numbers, lambda, so that exponential of lambda is algebraic. So this is the Q vector space of the logarithm of algebraic numbers when you take all the possible logarithms. And Serre states the Baker theorem by saying that the injection of L, it is a set of complex numbers into C, extent to a Q-bar linear map from Q-bar plus the tensor product of L with Q-bar into C. But uh, the statement of Baker is that this uh, map, this injection, extends, uh, is linear map. So I, I will uh, uh, phrase the conjecture of algebraic independence of logarithm in another equivalent way, in such a way that for this equivalent way, we can say something. There are several uh, ways to, to do that. Uh, when uh, you look at uh, the conjecture of algebraic independence of logarithm, you say, we start with logarithm and we ask whether there is a polynomial which vanishes at the point lambda one, lambda n. What uh, Damien Roy did is to uh, start with a polynomial he starts with a polynomial, E, and he asks what are the specialization of the variables, lambda 1, lambda n, so that P of lambda 1, lambda n uh, is equal to 0. So you see, changing the point of view. And from this point of view, uh, the conjecture of algebraic independence of logarithm looks like some statements which uh, are known in Diophantine geometry. We fix an algebraic subvariety of Cn defined over the field of algebraic numbers. And we look at the points in this subvariety which have the component coordinates, which are logarithm of algebraic numbers. Then only the trivial elements are there, which means that uh, this set is a union of the set E intersected with Ln. Instead of E, you have E. And E ranges over the set of vector subspaces of Cn, which are contained in V. So it's a change of uh, point of view, but uh, it is the same as the conjecture of algebraic independence. And uh, then there are some cases where it is possible to prove the, the conjecture. Uh, Damien Roy did it for Grassmannian varieties, and Stefan Fischler uh, did it in uh, several other cases. So at least something is known in this direction. I, we, I, I mentioned that uh, for linear independence, we have Baker theorem, but uh, the next uh, step is to look at the uh, quadratic relation. And uh, I will discuss uh, several open problems for quadratic relation among logarithm of algebraic numbers. The first uh, simple quadratic relation that we would like to study is log alpha one, log alpha two equal log beta, where alpha one, alpha two, and beta are algebraic numbers. And, uh, an example, if you take log alpha 1 and log alpha 2 equal i pi and minus i pi, you get beta equal exponential pi square. And uh, I mentioned that uh, we do not know whether e to the pi square is transcendental. I mentioned before that uh, if it is algebraic, then e and pi are algebraically independent, but uh, this is unlikely. So even this uh, simple quadratic relation is not known. We can look at the homogeneous quadratic relations. So the simplest one is uh, log alpha 1, log alpha 4 equal log alpha 2, log alpha 3. I write it like this because it is the same as the vanishing of the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix. We have some uh, trivial relations, uh, like log 2, log 9 equal log 4, log 3. And the four exponentials conjecture is that this kind of relation are the only ones 
among these or grid. If we have such a relation, then either log alpha one over log alpha two is rational, or log alpha one over log alpha three is irrational, or both. So this is the four exponential conjecture, which uh, arose from a paper by Ramanujan on uh, highly composite numbers. And uh, uh, Alaoglu and Erdos in 1944 uh, developed the work of uh, Ramanujan, and they faced a problem. And they asked uh, Ziegel whether Ziegel was able to solve this problem. And Ziegel said, no, I am not able to solve that. Uh, I, I state a special case of the problem they raise. Uh, the, the problem of uh, Alaoglu and Erdos that they asked to Ziegel was, you take a positive real number, t, and you assume that 2 power t and 3 power t are both integers. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was not 2 and 3, it was two prime numbers, but uh, let us take 2 and 3. The conclusion should be that t is an integer. And this is really the same as uh, before, because uh, you, you, you have the, if you take t equal log n over log 2, when you look at a 3 power t, it is exponential t log 3, which is n to the power log 3 over log 2. So it would give a relation, quadratic, homogeneous quadratic relation between four log width of algebraic numbers. And so uh, this problem is uh, not solved. It's uh, still an open problem. And Ziegel said that he was able to solve uh, an easier problem when you add the number 5 power t. If the three numbers, 2 to the t, 3 to the t, 5 to the t are integers, then t is an integer. Ziegel did not publish uh, his uh, result. The result was published by uh, Lang and Ramachandra. And this is the six exponential theorem. So uh, why the name four exponential and six exponential? Uh, in the case of 2 to the t and 3 to the t, uh, it means that you have a matrix log 2, log 3, t log 2, t log 3, which has, a non, uh, which has a zero determinant. And the entries would be logarithm of algebraic numbers. So the determinant is this one. And if you write a matrix log alpha ij, and if you say that this matrix has rank 1, it means that the alpha ij is of the form exponential xi, yj. This is the rank 1 matrix, xi, yj. And so you have four exponential. And the case of uh, Ziegel is 2 to the t, 3 to the t, 5 to the t. And so it is a 2 by 3 matrix. And you have six exponentials. So this is the name 4 and 6. So you see uh, the four exponential problem uh, deals with the rank of a matrix with entries, which are logarithm of algebraic numbers. And uh, from this point of view, something can be said on the algebraic dependence of log width. And I will introduce what uh, Damien Roy calls the structural rank of a matrix with entries in L. So the entries are logarithm of algebraic numbers. So you take such a matrix, the entries are log alpha ij, and you look at the Q vector space, which is spanned by the log alpha ij. So uh, you have a dimension, finitely many of them, m, the dimension, and you write the entries as linear combinations with rational coefficients of the elements of the basis. After you did that, you replace the basis by variables x1, xm. And then you get a matrix with entries which are rational fraction. In fact, there are linear forms in x1, xm, but uh, I wish to consider them as the, in the field of rational fraction. You look at the rank of that matrix, and this is what Damien Roy calls the structure rank, structural rank of M. And it's an exercise to see that it does not depend on the choice of the basis. Now, the conjecture of algebraic independence of logarithm tells you that the, the elements of the basis, which are Q linearly independent logarithm of algebraic numbers, should be algebraically independent. And the, therefore, it implies that both matrices have the same rank. So I introduce here a more general definition, but uh, I see that uh, I already spoke for 45 minutes and I am uh, more or less uh, halfway of my slides. So I will not uh, 
say they too much time on that, but uh, I would like to say that uh, according to Damien Roy, the homogeneous case of the conjecture of algebraic independence of logarithm is equivalent to the fact that uh, if you have a matrix with logarithm uh, of algebraic numbers entries, the rank of the matrix is equal to the structural rank, which means that uh, if you want to solve the problem of algebraic independence of logarithm, you just have to look at uh, matrices where the entries are logarithm of algebraic numbers. And what is interesting is that for this formulation, the conjecture is that both ranks are the same, but uh, Damien Roy is able to prove that the rank of a matrix with logarithm of algebraic numbers entries is at least half its structural rank with respect to Q. So something is known in this direction. We can say Sorry, that- uh, Can you specify what a structural rank? Yes. Okay, so I, I repeat what it is. Uh, I, I repeat it in the special case, which is you. I think it's easier. You take a matrix. The coefficients are logarithm of algebraic numbers. So you take a basis of the space spanned by the entries, a basis of a Q. And the elements of the basis, you replace them by variables, by indeterminates, X1, Xn. Yeah, I see. And then you have a, a matrix with the entries in Q of X1, Xn. And this is the rank of this matrix is the structural rank. Okay. So it is quite interesting that uh, both statements are equivalent. In one direction, it's clear the conjecture of algebraic independence implies that the rank is equal to the structural rank because the, the uh, logarithm, the basis of the space uh, uh, should be algebraically independent. But the converse is true. And uh, and even I, I spoke of homogeneous, uh, 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 the homogeneous conjecture of algebraic independence. If you do not want to have it homogeneous, you just add the uh, algebraic numbers or even only rational numbers here. And so uh, the lemma which uh, gives the equivalence between the two statements is, is a nice lemma which uh, uh, is of independent interest. You take a polynomial in several variables then there exists a square matrix where the entries are linear forms in one x1 xn and the determinant of this uh, matrix is p so any polynomial is the determinant of a matrix okay so i i will uh, go uh, rather fast for the next slides uh, in fact uh, uh, there are some results by damien roy which should deal with the cuba vector space spine by one and L, which means that uh, instead of taking logarithm of algebraic numbers, he can take linear combination of one and logarithm of algebraic numbers. And there, there are a lot of uh, results we, which, uh, which are known about the structural rank. And I, I discuss also some further quadratic relations which are not homogeneous, uh, which is log alpha one, log alpha two equal gamma. And uh, in this direction, there are some very nice conjecture of uh, Damien Roy. Okay, so I, I will uh, pass some uh, uh, quite interesting approach of Chanel conjecture, which is due to Damien Roy, and uh, which gave rise to uh, further recent development by a student of Damien Roy, Nguyen Gok Aivan, who got some nice results in this direction. Chanel conjecture occurs in many circumstances on the periodic rank of the unit of an algebraic number field. This is uh, how I started to be involved uh, on, on this topic uh, uh, suggest, uh, after the suggestion of my thesis advisor, Jean Fresnel. So non-vanishing of, of regulator, non-degenerations of height. There are some work in particular by Daniel Bertrand and the conjecture of measure on rational point and Diophantine approximation on tori. So I just give two uh, uh, references here. Okay, I, I will uh, switch, uh, I, I will pass uh, this uh, work of uh, Bunchu, which uh, uh, develops some consequences of Chanuet conjecture. And uh, uh, in, in this direction, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of things to say, but uh, I am afraid that uh, my, my time is almost uh, over. And there are some consequences of uh, Chanuet conjecture uh, dealing with the uh, uh, with the Catalan constant. I will uh, just stop with this uh, slide uh, where I uh, just mentioned that there are further applications of Chanel conjecture 
uh, one good reference is the book on transcendental numbers by uh, Ram Murthy and Purusutam Rat, uh, where they discuss Shanwell conjecture and transcendental values of Dirichlet series, the Baker Birch Versing theorem, transcendence of some infinite series, of values of Dirichlet L function and value of class group L function. And so uh, you will see a lot of uh, further application of uh, Shanwell's conjecture uh, in this book. So I think uh, I just spoke for 50 minutes, so it's probably time that uh, I stop now. Thank you very much. So just uh, my last, last slide. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michel. Yes, so uh, let, uh, well, maybe there are some questions. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, would you mind? Yes, um, I had to. I had some postal delivery, and I had to um, leave for just one second. Where were you explaining this uh, lemma of uh, Damien Oa? Can you return to that slide? Yes, it, it, it's it's a nice result. Is this one? Yes. Yes. So, mm -hmm. You take a polynomial with coefficient in a field K. A polynomial in several variables. Ah, well, very good. And then you can show that there exists a matrix. In fact, you, you can construct a matrix. It's really uh, effective. You can construct a square matrix. The coefficients of the square matrix are linear forms in one x1 xn. So there are polynomials of degree one in x1 xn. And the determinant of this matrix is p. Oof. It's quite uh, uh, tricky. It's uh, very nice. Yeah. Huh? There is an induction. And uh, OK, uh, one reference is my uh, uh, Grundlehren. Uh, ah, the, in your Grundlehren book. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. It, the, the, the full proof is there with a lot of applications. OK, wonderful. But of course, there is also some reference due to Damien Roy. OK, thank you very much. OK, more questions? Balu, you have a question? No. OK, okay. then uh, thank you, Michel. And uh, well, uh, I think uh, this. Uh, okay. let, thank, uh, let us thank Michel again. And uh, I think uh, the yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Over, so I pass. I pass the the uh, word to Purushutam. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Yuri, for chairing the session, and let us thank all the speakers of this session uh, for this beautiful talk. So we have a, uh, a break of about uh, twenty-eight minutes, and we uh, reassemble at four thirty in the in the second day. Thank you once again, Yuri, and Michelle and all other speakers.